You're tuned in to The Andrew Lawton Show. I have not been as fearful of artificial intelligence as some people have, because I don't think that human intelligence has often served as well. But uh, that's a bit of a glib joke to start off what is a serious discussion, which is what AI is doing to discourse and to thought. Now, uh, we haven't talked a lot about AI on this show. I, I've kind of been waiting for the right angle and the right opportunity. And I should say, I've been one of these people that has sort of enjoyed the novelty of it. When ChatGPT has come up and you get the ability to just have a quick conversation uh, with this thing and have it give you some uh, response to a question. And uh, there's a program that I've had some fun with called MidJourney which will create AI-generated images. And you can give it a whole bunch of prompts. I've had a lot of fun with this one. The, the one that I did, I won't show you because I wasn't thrilled with it, but I asked for like childhood photos of Fidel Castro pushing young Justin Trudeau on a swing. Uh, but the AI was getting Fidel Castro and Justin Trudeau's faces mixed up, which uh, maybe makes it smarter than humans. Who knows? Uh, and then I also had some fun this morning and I asked to get like some photographs of Christian Freeland driving. So maybe we can throw those up. Yeah, there we go. I, these are the samples it gave me. I thought that speed demon, uh, Christian Freeland, uh, fresh off the heels of getting her ticket for going however many kilometers over. That's uh, her uh, basically road racing down some Alberta highway. I like the one on the bottom right myself, although it looks a little terrifying. Uh, that one, it looks to be in Ottawa, though. You can see in the, the back right there, it looks to be a center block that she's just like leaving in the dust there. The one on the top right is good. It's a little aspirational. She's uh, she's really flying there so much that she needs the space helmet. She's putting on so many miles and going so fast, she has ascended off the ground. So uh, take from that what you will. Uh, but for all the fun that AI offers, and yes, there is some, uh, it also has very serious implications. And those implications we have not really fully explored because uh, despite the fact that this technology has been in development for many, many years, it really seems it's only been in the last year uh, that people have started to grapple with the real world implications of it. And, you know, we see this in academ academia where universities which have had to focus on detecting plagiarism now have this new, new problem, which is did students just create something original by entering a few prompts for their essay assignments into uh, chat GPT or whatnot. Uh, there's a great piece in C2C Journal by Christopher Snook about this called AI, the destruction of thought and the end of the humanities. Uh, he is a lecturer with Dalhousie University and a contributor to C2C Journal. And he joins us now, uh, not an AI generated version, but the man himself. Uh, good to talk to you, Christopher. Thanks for coming on. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you so much for the invitation. So let's start first off with, with where your issue is with this. Why are you concerned about AI in the context here? Yeah, I can. I, I suppose I can answer that in a, in a fairly simple way. Um, as you've already indicated, there's a great deal of joy maybe to be had with playing with sort of AI applications. Um, but at the simplest level, uh, I suppose maybe I could say two things. Uh, one would be that AI introduces, I'm a humanities teacher, so AI generated uh, content introduces into the university and uh, into students' lives, very easy uh, possibilities of escaping um, from a certain kind of reflection that may be essential to their development uh, within the context of the humanities historically. Uh, but secondly, I think I have a, pr a pretty significant concern that AI is actually indicative in many respects um, of a much longer trend in humanities education in Canada that has fairly uncritically assimilated new technological developments without reflecting on their consequences for pedagogy and education. That's quite an interesting approach to this. And, and you know, one thing that I always recall, even from my own time in university, is, is that essays were, were very challenging. I, I would do better at them now, but they were very challenging because you, you can't really cheat your way through an essay, unless you're actually cheating and plagiarizing and whatnot, because it's not just about knowing the facts. You can't Google the answer to the question when you basically have to show your work and, and show how you arrived at something. And, and, and certainly in an academic context, AI has huge implications for that, because all of a sudden someone else could do the thinking with you. I could just give this uh, machine uh, a bunch of different data points and say, formulate an argument for me. And that, that's something, I mean, I've talked to professors who have already been complaining about the decline in critical thinking in universities. And now mm -hmm. we've added this other tool, which maybe can be used for good, but also can further erode people having to come up with these skills on their own. 
Yeah, what I tried to do in the article, I mean, maybe if I if I kind of talk about some of the points in the article, that may be helpful for for at least giving giving people a sense of uh, where my concern lies. So I my concern really grew out of two things that I saw in the university last year. So the first was a, I mean a remarkable amount of energy and anxiety around the appearance of things like ChatGPT, right? Sort of um, large language models that can produce texts fairly competently, increasingly competently uh, for students with very, very little to no work on their side. So there's a huge amount of anxiety, as you pointed to, Andrew, earlier in your introduction, uh, in your introduction to this conversation. Um, it's a different, it's not even plagiarism in any recognizable sense. It's just allowing AI to generate texts um, from uh, the information it's kind of gathered through its internet, uh, through its chatbots on the internet. Um, so there was a huge conversation about this in the university. And what I noted was that primarily that conversation was focused on questions of use. And so I spent some time teaching engineers, though I teach humanities to engineers, and they very patiently kind of uh, tolerate this course. I was going to say that seems like a very that seems like a very difficult challenge for you. Oh, it's a hard sell. It's a hard sell, but they're, but they're very patient and they they tolerate this sort of required course on uh, effectively on the history of technologies. And one of the key things that uh, I've been thinking about since teaching this course uh, is what uh, Neil Postman simply observes, which is that the introduction of every new technology doesn't simply give a new tool to humans, but uh, he he sort of coined the idea or helped uh, kind of articulate the idea that every technology shifts the world ecologically in much the same way that an ecosystem is changed if a new um, species is introduced, right? So it's not just that we have all of a sudden AI, but rather that the whole world shifts around the availability of these new technologies. And embedded in these technologies are certain assumptions about what it is to be human. And so I, this is a bit of a rambling uh, um, response to your previous comment, but what I noticed uh, in the university over the last six or seven months is that the conversation has been almost exclusively focused on use. There have been some people who are sort of uh, diametrically opposed uh, to the appearance of AI in any form in the university. I kind of tend in that direction, certainly for the humanities. Um, others who are much more uh, supportive of the use of AI in various ways to facilitate writing. Um, but regardless of where one stood on that stands on the use of AI, I've noticed that very few people are asking deeper questions, such as what kind of world does AI produce and what kind of world view or what sort of assumptions are built into the technology. Uh, and it's there that I think universities need to really be careful about the implementation of AI, um, partly because I think AI actually uh, reveals is a bit apocalyptic. That is, it kind of reveals something about the nature of higher education in Canada that's been developing for years. And we could talk about that sort of narrowing of viewpoint diversity, different different aspects of the university life. Um, but also, I think um, the other thing that I think has been missed is that AI um, uh, AI generated texts. Uh, uh, pushes against certain proclaimed uh, positions, moral positions that the university has adopted in the last, hmm. maybe in the last decade. One aspect that this springs to mind, and you, you address it in the piece uh, in one section anyway, notably, is, is the idea of bias. And, you know, facts in theory are neutral and they do not have a political persuasion. It's the assembly of facts and the uh, composition of various facts that you can use to sort of demonstrate something that is a bit more biased. And, and one thing we've seen in AI is how it's providing, it, it's doing the thinking for you in, in theory. But, but the problem with that, among others, is that it is producing a biased outcome. It's producing a, a biased response. I mean, I, I had once when I was first playing around with ChatGPT, a debate with a machine. So the joke was on me about what a woman is. And, and it right. was interesting seeing this machine twist itself into all of these many logical knots about uh, trying to answer this question. But it was actually quite terrifying how it started giving me the talking points I would expect if I were having this with some university diversity administrator. And it started telling me about inclusivity and tolerance and women can come in any forms. And, and uh, there, there is something there in, in which AI is basically telling people that there is one way to construct a thought when it does this, there, that, that you aren't actually able to assemble facts into different worldviews. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that's true. And I, certainly the studies have the studies have varied and in some cases disagree a little bit with one another about where the biases are found in AI technologies. So some people have, there's been some studies that have tried to argue that there's, uh, because some of the early um, scraping of the internet focused primarily on on uh, Reddit sites, that there was a kind of conservative or male mm -hmm. bias somehow in, 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 in the, uh, in the, 
technology, but it seems to me fairly clear now that the technology seems to be biased fairly clearly, I think, in the other direction in terms of um, uh, the kinds of sources that it's recycling when it's when it's producing kind of mashup texts. Um, so I began the article, and this was one of the things, maybe a way of thinking about AI in a broader context or sort of moving back from the technology to think about what it has to say about universities. Um, I began the article in C2C really just by reflecting on the fact that um, a kind of formulaic uh, response to the work of pedagogy has become characteristic of universities generally in Canada, and it's in part indicated through the demand that applicants for university positions um, complete diversity, equity, and inclusion statements, diversity statements as part of their application packages. Um, and kind of famously, or if you follow these sort of stories, infamously, depends on depends on what one thinks about all these things. Um, a professor in the in the United States asked ChatGPT to produce a diversity document just last year, and he was astounded to see, just as you've described, the speed with which ChatGPT Chat was able to reproduce all of the talking points and all of the assumptions of a fairly kind of middle of the road Canadian um, higher education position on uh, issues of diversity, uh, inclusion and equity. Um, to my mind, what that revealed was that we're, we're sort of beginning to operate in the university in a world that is fairly, um, uh, at the very least formulaic in its expectations of what, whatever diversity, uh, inclusion and equity may be about or diversity, equity and inclusion. Um, so it was from there really in the article that I, I wanted to try to see or to explore how is it that the technologies that are available to, now, to us now in the university and that have been slowly uh, growing in their implementation in the university over the last um, 15 or 20 years may actually be um, both accelerated by the advent of AI, but may also be in a certain sense pointing towards AI, that is to say pointing towards a world in which a kind of formulaic regurgitation of information becomes a kind of normative expectation um, of students, even in the context of their degrees. So um, that's sort of where the where the article began. So this just to sort of maybe make a connection with what you found when you, when you poked and prodded uh, at ChatGPT, that it, it, it tends to kind of produce um, fairly predictable results relative to certain questions. Well, there is also to this, I mean, the, the most, I guess, cogent defense I hear of, of AI is that AI is little more than a mirror uh, to the existing world. I, I mean, AI is not really formulating its own uh, materials that it's not drawing from the, the trove of, of inputs. Now, obviously, individual inputs can be manipulated, and we also have terms of use that govern it. I, I'm trying to bring us away from the use discussion of this that uh, you were talking about earlier, but I, I guess in that sense, is this just reflecting an existing problem, or is this making it worse? Right, yeah, that's a very good question. I would say from, I, there might be two things to say about that. On the one hand, I, from, from my perspective, and this was maybe my concern with the conversation so far in higher education in Canada about AI, its preoccupation with questions of use has really prevented people from asking a much slower and more difficult question, which is to say, is this actually of benefit or is it is it uh, simply a reflection of the world we're in or is it making things worse? Right? So I think that that deeper question about the, um, the kind of ecosystem consequences or cultural consequences of AI is not really um, being asked. Um, so that is to say, AI at some level is a kind of metaphor in much the same way one might think about um, COVID as a kind of, we can think about it as, a, as, a, as an illness, but we can also think about COVID response, at least, as a bit of a metaphor of our contemporary culture, cultural moment. Um, so there is that mirroring back. But I would say from the perspective of pedagogy, AI raises some some very deep questions that, to my mind, intensify problems that were already present. So, so it's not it's not so much that it simply introduces a newness that's radical, but intensifies certain very particular problems. So one of those problems, I think, is the is uh, connected to the to the use of devices generally for humanities education in particular. So. Um, one of the things I think many of us have experienced is the extent to which screens and screen reading and iPhones or cell phones, uh, the extent to which they actually produce in us kind of habits of scanning, a kind of hyper-attention, what one scholar calls forms of hyper-attention, not focused attention or contemplative reflection, but a kind of 
hyperattention that actually tends to kind of lead us towards a certain kind of rashness in our decision making. So that's one a deep and profound concern I have, especially when institutions seem to be dominated by certain sets of political commitments that ought themselves to be subject to serious reflection and consideration, right? So if we're in an environment where there's certain assumptions about what political positions are normative, it needs to be the case that those can be thought about deeply uh, and reflectively. And if we're using technologies that limit that capacity, then we're in a little bit of danger. Uh, but the other one, I think for me, from the perspective as a teacher, uh, is that, uh, and this would be, I mean, I, I'm affiliated with the classics department and I spend a lot of time in the last number of years uh, teaching Augustine, a sort of famous foundational voice uh, for the Western world. And Augustine uh, is one of many thinkers who highlights the fundamental role of memory in the constitution of our personalities, the sort of crucial role that memory plays. And it's kind of essential to technologies like ChatGPT that we offload or offshore um, our, the, the faculty of memory to the technological device, right? It does the work for us, right? So I don't struggle with Augustine or Dante or Homer or any of those things. I, I let ChatGPT do the struggle in a certain sense, I and mean, it's not really struggling, but I let it do the amalgamation of opinion making and formation, and I'm left passive in that response. So in that sense, I think the technologies actually inhibit the kind of interior dialogue that's fundamental to education, but, but that's also fundamental to being a free person in the world. Right? Hannah Arendt, I think, points this up very, very powerfully in her reflections on totalitarianism. If we can't have a dialogue with ourselves, if we're pulled out of ourselves endlessly and offshore even our memory, uh, we lose the ability to actually be free agents in the world. So these are some of the things that I'm very concerned about at the level of pedagogy, which is why I, I, I tend to the to, to a pretty puritanical, I suppose, relationship to AI when it comes to the, at least to humanities classrooms. I recognize AI has different applications mm -hmm. in, different, in different contexts. It's funny, at the risk of oversimplifying it, I, I think of, you know, a movie that I, I've watched that, you know, say is two hours long. I could find out what happens in that movie in about 60 seconds by just reading a plot synopsis on Wikipedia. But I don't do that. I watch the movie because there, there is something in that process. You feel, you see, you learn, you, you get insights. It's the same as why, you know, despite the fact that I may not have taken this advice when I was in high school, reading the Coles notes of something <laughs> is not the same as, as reading the thing itself. I mean, I could get chat GPT to say, you know, give me some bullet points that I can bring up in tutorial about, uh, you know, the cave or something. But that doesn't mean right. I, I've done that. So you, you're quite right. And, and, and I also wonder, I mean, to appeal to your department, the classics, if you were to if you were to input into uh, chat GPT, the most beautiful works of literature of classics that you'd ever seen and said, create something like this. Could it do that in your view? Could it create the beauty that we have seen from all of these people thousands of years ago. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. That's a very hotly debated topic, as you may know. Of course, in the in the world of visual arts, someone recently was awarded a prize, right, in, in the visual arts for an artificially uh, created, produced um, image. All kinds of, of course, very deep ethical questions around AI and its its accumulation of information and how that happens. Um, but, uh, you know, from my perspective, for, for me, the answer to that question was really given quite beautifully by Nick Cave recently. Nick Cave, the Australian uh, singer songwriter, uh, was asked this question. A fan sent him uh, a poem that ChatGPT had written when he asked uh, ChatGPT, write me a poem or a song in the style of Nick Cave. Uh, and Nick Cave's response was to say that uh, even if it were a good song, which uh, Nick Cave refused to concede that it was a good uh, imitation, um, he said that uh, the problem is that ChatGPT, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, has been nowhere and suffered nothing. Uh, hmm. And to be human in the world at all, as someone like Jordan Peterson is constantly reminding us, is to suffer and out of that suffering, either to, to sort of produce meaning in the world and in our lives. Um, uh, and I've, I've been fairly persuaded by Nick Cave that, that no matter how close the approximation that one might be able to artificially reproduce, uh, the fact that the, uh, the technology has itself been nowhere and suffered nothing means that uh, that material can have very little consequence for me. Uh, as someone who lives in the world with all of its fragility. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I guess that would be my, my, that would be my answer, which isn't, uh, I mean, 
yeah, maybe not the best answer, but no, um, it, it is interesting. And I, now I'm, I'm now I'm like geeking out on this topic myself. So I think we'll have to have you back on a, in another show. But you know, I remember when, when I did, uh, you know, tutorials in, in various classes in university, the, the one thing that was always so critical when you were understanding a work was to understand the author and the context in which they wrote a particular work. And even if the author is some professor who's still alive, understanding how that professor came about, you know, you read, uh, for example, a you know, a dissertation and you say, oh, well, this was an environmental historian. Why were they writing about this issue? And, and uh, with, with chat GPT, that, that context is eroded because there is no human context or it's a, an amalgamation of, you know, 150 human contexts that you don't actually know about and can't see. So I, I think that's a less elegant way of, of describing what you've shared from uh, Nick Cave there. And I, I thank you for it. The piece in C2C Journal is AI, the Destruction of Thought and the End of the Humanities by Christopher Snook. And they also have uh, another part of this series written by uh, Gleb Lysak, who we had on the show a couple of weeks ago about something else entirely. Uh, Christopher, thanks so much for coming on. Good to talk to a, a real human in this day and age. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew, very much. I appreciate it a great deal. Thanks for listening to The Andrew Lawton Show. Support the program by donating to True North at www.tnc.news.